Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you all. Welcome to American Islamic College. My name is Romano Manzur, and I'm the Director of Accreditation and Institutional Research and Effectiveness, which is a long title, <laughs> here at AIC. And I have the honor of being your MC for the evening. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to say a few words about who we are and acknowledge the land we are sitting on and in performing in, inshallah. Steeped in the Islamic values of creational stewardship and justice, all of us at American Islamic College believe that God has entrusted the lands and waters he created to humankind, who were created to serve God and the creation as stewards or caretakers. We also believe that we must stand for justice even when we ourselves may be implicated. So we want to begin today by acknowledging that our campus sits on land that was originally entrusted to the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, peoples whose sovereignty, culture, and very lives were violated by colonial policy. Here, just west of where land meets water, is the historical land of the Council of Three Fires, the Confederate nations of the Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi nations. We acknowledge and honor them, their descendants, and their land and waterways. Welcoming students of all faiths and backgrounds, American Islamic College is a liberal arts, Chicago-based, accredited institution of higher learning <laughs> with a global reach offering both on-site and online courses. AIC is grounded in Islamic values, promoting an appreciation for the scope and richness of Islamic thought, history, and artistic expression. We offer a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in Islamic Studies, a Master of Divinity in Islamic Studies and Muslim Chaplaincy, and every summer we host two 10-week Arabic language intensive programs, each equivalent to two academic semesters of Arabic study. Through rigorous scholarships and a commitment to justice, the collective good, and the collective good, AIC offers programs such as this one to prepare students to become critical thinkers, leaders, and responsible global citizens. So today, we gather to honor El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. May God be merciful to him, pop, pop, popularly known as Malcolm X. El Shabazz's views on global injustices were deeply rooted in his analysis of systemic oppression and colonialism. Mm. He saw the struggle for racial equality in the US as part of a broader global movement against imperialism, racism, and exploitation. Mm. His views continue to influence activists and scholars working on issues of justice today. And the one ever present today is the plight of the Gazan people in the aftermath of October 7th and the crisis of, for Palestine since 1948. El Shabazz visited Gaza and toured Palestine, remarking, quote, just as the civil rights movement in the US fought against the chains of racial discrimination, so too do the Palestinian people strive to shatter the chains of occupation and tyranny. Mm that the Palestinians, much like the African Americans in the US, have been subjected to a heart-wrenching history of suffering and torment." End quote. El Shabazz had a deep love and fascination with Sudan and Sudanese people, culture, and history. Sudanese civilians have been living through an ongoing war since 2003 as a result of colonial projects, sanctions, arms deals, and so on by the quote-unquote superpowers. More than 6.5 million Sudanese people have been displaced in this last year alone due to civil war. And so on this weekend that we honor El Shabazz's birthday, his words remain ever present, <coughs> ever revealing, and ever true. As I share this, I'm reminded of the work that so many activist scholars are promoting in higher education around a decolonized curriculum, a decolonized pedagogy. What what he fought for is the basis for this kind of work. And in my graduate coursework that advanced these thoughts and ideas, never was Brother Malcolm mentioned. So even the work of decolonialization, that needs some decolonizing, right? And so we begin today with some introspection, checking ourselves, centering our intentions, and then beginning the work, inshallah. Bismillah. Thank you again for joining us today as we raise funds for Sudan and Gaza. The collection will go to Islamic Relief. I'd now like to invite the president of American Islamic College, Dr. Timothy Giannotti, our visionary leader, whom I'm proud
proud to work for as he advances AIC's mission and vision forward, undeterred to meet the challenges of today, committed to an ennobling education, dedicated to welcoming all as they are. He will introduce our esteemed panelists and will engage in a discussion, and then we will hear from some of Malcolm, Malcolm's or El Shabazz's favorites performed by Chicago's finest jazz ensemble, Jazz Explosion. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Timothy Giannotti. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Assalamu We begin always by not just wishing peace upon one another, but because Assalam is one of the names of God, it's one of the living names of God Almighty. It's an invocation for God's presence. It's an invocation, it's an invitation for us, for ourselves, and for one another to awaken ourselves to the presence of the divine in our midst as peace, as healing, as wholeness. And we do so in a time where the world is broken and consumed by forces that are diabolical and dehumanizing and degrading. And it's such an honor to have an opportunity in an institution, a faith-based institution which understands itself to be unapologetically, proudly Muslim, but for the benefit of all. That we are here tonight to have an opportunity to stand together for something life-giving, something luminous, for justice. And it is my honor to be part of a team here at AIC which has reawakened this college, has renewed its vision, and has reset its, its trajectory of development in a, along a pathway that, that is destined, God willing, to be one of America's great universities. So as we begin with these three flagship programs, we look forward to opening up new majors and new programs and to branching out into business and science and Islamically integrated psychotherapy and so many other fields that will bring healing and bring benefit to this broken city and this broken world. And we welcome and honor students of every part of the Muslim mosaic without discriminating, without interrogating whose Islam is the real Islam, welcoming back the Muslim family to a place of unity and honor and respect and dignity and welcoming the world to join us. I don't know very much about visionary leadership. Certainly my wife has a totally different uh, way of describing who and what I am. But I could never do what I do without the incredible team. And so I would like all of my team to stand up. Masoud is already standing, so you're good, bro. <laughs> But I'd like my brother Randall and Sister Romana and Sister Nazha. I mean, th these, really, I mean, th these people are lighting the world up in their own way. And <clears throat> they're self-starting, they're, they're committed to this cause. Romana has been with this dream, this reawakening, renewing, bringing life back to the vision, the dream of what the American Islamic College was initially created to be. She's been with this renewed institution since the very beginning, since before we even reopened for classes in 2013. And that dedication to the dream, that tenacity, that, that refusal to give up and surrender is what we need more of in the world today. And that's one of the ways, we, that's one of the benefits of coming together in an evening like tonight is as we renew one another's commitment to what is difficult, but worth living for. And so here we are tonight. I'm so honored to be with this panel, and I'm so honored to not subject you to me talking tonight. But we'll have a chance to listen to a sister who actually knew Brother Malcolm. We'll have a, an evening of listening to a brother and a scholar who who knows the situation in the Sudan inside and out. And we have the honor of listening to a Palestinian brother who can give us an inside information, inside view as to what that struggle, what's going on, and what, what it means for the people of Palestine 
both in the diaspora and, and still in the land, to stand and to struggle for human dignity, to stand and struggle for justice, to stand and, and, and cry out as a voice of conscience to a world which is watching day by day, play by play, watching ethnic cleansing and genocide unfold without intervening. I've learned so much. In fact, I learned Arabic, you know. I don't know, we, had, we didn't have a chance to talk before, but I learned my Arabic with the Palestinian, the people of Palestine. I've had the privilege of drinking gallons and gallons of sweet tea in Palestinian refugee camps and learning, as an American, learning about my complicity in the suffering of this incredible people that did never, that showed me nothing but hospitality and love and hope and resilience. And so it's an honor for me to be with you, brother. So let's introduce our panelists, even though they probably don't need to be introduced. And I'll try to, if I, if I don't know something about you that, I, that nobody else knows, then I'll ask you to share it with me. So Dr. Lin, Dr. Lin Muhammad is, I'm proud to say, she's one of our faculty members and she's someone that I hope and pray will have an increasing presence here at AIC as we go forward. She holds a doctorate degree from Loyola University of Chicago and teaches biology for us to our undergraduate students. She's also the founder of the Stream Lab, which is a hands-on interactive program designed to help youth between the ages of 18 and 15 learn how to integrate skills learned in school into a cohesive tool for solving problems. She serves as the chair of the science department at Whitney Young Margaret High School. Magnet. Magnet High School, thank you. Where she has taught for more than 16 years. And she's also, you know, a shining example of a woman who I'm sure there weren't very many women earning PhDs in biology in your day. But as someone who really paved the way for other women to, to follow, to pursue careers in science. And I, one thing about Dr. Lin that I know just because she told me is that uh, Imam Waradi Muhammad, salam, may, may God's peace and blessings be upon him and God's mercy be with him. He asked her, he wanted her to do her graduate work in Arabic and Islamic studies. But she knew in her heart that she was a scientist. And so she respectfully walked her own path and became a doctor in biology and in science. And, uh, and so I, I think that it, it takes great heart to follow a great leader, but it takes even greater heart to respectfully and lovingly walk your own way when you know that what God is calling you to is something different. So that's uh, it's really incredible. So we're honored to have, I'm honored to have Dr. Lin here sitting next to me. Dr. Kim Searcy is an associate professor at Loyola University did his PhD at Indiana University, where he teach courses on Islam, Sudan, Islam in East Africa, African history, and Islam in the African American experience. He's written extensively on the Sudan, has been there many times, and is, uh, and is also um, you know, looking more broadly at Muslim movements in Africa and Muslim movements in North Africa. And, uh, and I just learned tonight before we started that uh, he learned, he moved around a lot because his dad was in the Air Force, but, uh, but his favorite place growing up was in the UK. So we're willing to forgive you for that. But, uh, but uh, you have to come up to Canada sometime and, and see what that's like. Because he, he loved the idea that, you know, he lived in a society where, where when people get sick, they just go to the hospital. Like Americans can't even like believe that in Canada, like so close, uh, that when people get sick, they just go to the hospital. I know people that have been in the ICU for weeks and weeks, and their families have never seen a bill for that. It's just mind-boggling, you know, to most Americans. But, uh, but I, I think what you loved about the UK, I also love about, about Canada, our neighbors to the north. So that's wonderful. And then finally, my brother Tarek Khalil. Tarek is an attorney and an activist. He graduated from UIC and John Marshall Law School. He's an education coordinator at, the Amer at American Muslims for Palestine. With AMP, Tariq lectures on topics such as modern Palestinian history, Middle East politics, and Palestinian rights under international law. And Brother Tariq, tell us something that, that we don't know. So where in Palestine is your family from originally? My uh, 
fam well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much for having me. We're honored to um, have you. And uh, to answer that, to answer that question, I was just in Palestine for the first time in over two decades, actually, wow. because of the visa waiver program that allowed Palestinians who are American citizens to travel on a, without without having a visa, and that le that loosened um, the restrictions that are usually imposed on Palestinian entry, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, mm. actually. But uh, I'm from Silwan, which is a neighborhood in Al-Quds, which is mm. Jerusalem, and it's a heavily Ju Judaized area, mm. and my uncle still lives there, my aunt still lives there, my father's home was um, taken through family com complicity, um, un un unfortunately, and you know the people that are living there are subject to a policy of uh, Israel that Im that imposes a demographic uh, ratio of 60 to 40, 70 to, to 30. So they must maintain a 70% Jewish presence in in Jerusalem, and not more than a 30 to 40% presence of Palestinian Arabs to maintain mm. Jewish supremacy. There's a lot more to go into that, but I'm from that neighborhood, which is a heavily coveted area that Zionists call the city of David, and that's part of the you know. Uh, this exilic myth, Jews mm. gone for 2,000 years, they've finally come back to the city of David. It's a very important piece of real estate, mm. and that is why they would love all Palestinians to leave that area. For mm. Utsi, yeah. Yeah, so he's a Jerusalemite. You know? I lived uh, two blocks away from uh, Masjid al Aqsa. MashaAllah. So Masha I, used to, I used to walk every Friday and pray. MashaAllah. Beautiful. Okay, so without further ado, then I'm just <laughs> going to invite our panelists because today is we're in honor of Brother Malcolm. So I'll let Dr. Lynn lead us in her recollections of Dr. Malcolm and her reflections on his life and legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. And for those who do not know, that means God's peace be with you. So first of all, it's an honor to be here in this position to be able to address El Haji Malik Shabazz and his contribution to all of humanity, whether we're in a crisis situation or not, it's an honor to be able to represent what he attempted to do and alhamdulillah was successful at doing with bringing our minds closer to the understanding that humanity matters, that human mm. beings matter. Mm. The capitalistic dollar, that's not it. Mm. We matter as human beings and that was a huge portion of what he tried to do. So I wanted to begin by um, correcting one point. I personally did not know him specifically. My father did. I'm mm. too young. So I did mm. not know him directly. I was thinking you were just a little yeah, tiny I, girl, a little I, tiny I, thing. If I okay. did meet him, I, I don't remember. Right. But my father knew him, and my father, was work, my father worked for the Nation of Islam, and um, he became a member of the Nation of Islam as part of his adult life, and so my father knew him as an adult. But what I wanted to do was to back up a little bit with his history and go even further back, and that's by looking at the book that he eventually embraced as, as representation of Allah's instructions to us, and that is the Quran. When you were reading the Quran, and I'm not gonna try to quote or anything from it, I'm just gonna generalize right now, when we're reading the Quran, it's extremely important for us to understand that the book has a series of concepts that runs throughout the entire Quran. This ayat will reflect, you'll see reflected in another surah in another place, and it'll continue to be there. So the messages, messages that Allah put in the Quran are consistent. They're consistent. And if you see something in one place, you can't pull that out of isolation and expect to use that unless you recognize how it fits within the entire book. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking for models and examples of what we hold to be dear, we have to use the tools that Allah has given us for answers. And so when we're looking at a pillar of strength, such as al Haji Malik Shabazz, we have to look at his life as an example of a pattern. What is it that this young man did, older man did, that was consistent? And how did he, and what is that legacy, and how did he leave for us um, an example of what we can use today, especially in a time like we're in now? And that's one of the things I wanted to try to get across to us today. 
El Haji Malik Shabazz was born, um, his family started out in Oklahoma. His father, um, his mother and father were listening to the words of Marcus Garvey, looking for answers to the situation that they as African Americans in the United States of America had to deal with. One of the things that they recognized because of the oppression that they were under from this country was that they themselves were not, this was not their destiny. They saw a need to do more. And Marcus Garvey gave them a way to start to look for some answers. One of the things that he pushed was separating so that we can do better. If the area you're in is not working for you, you don't have to deal with it. So separating not from physically, maybe it is physically, but separating at least from the regime that's keeping you down. And so as a young man, this is the type of home that he lived in. His father passed, he winded up um, actually being put into a foster care situation, which put in Lansing, Michigan, it put him in a, a community that didn't look like his skin. He didn't have a problem with it, but the people did. He wanted to be a lawyer. He was told by one of his teachers, people like you grow up to be carpenters, grow up to be laborers. You don't, just put that out of your mind. Did that stop him? It, it held him back for a minute, but it did not stop him. And he continued to pursue doing things that he felt was within him. And he kept running into these brick walls. So as a young man, still running into these brick walls, he was a little disillusioned. He stepped off the path for a minute, got into a little trouble, winded up in prison. Now when he's in prison, he's not looking at this as the end of all of it. He's seeing, I'm, okay, I still got stuff to do. And that's where he was introduced to Islam. And he saw that as an opportunity for him to get out of the situation that he was in. He saw that as an answer. And so he continued to pursue that path. Now the, the, the form of, the nation, of um, Islam that he became familiar with at the beginning was not Orthodox Islam. It was not the Islam that we recognize today. It was an Islam that it's, it is recognized, but it's not recognized by the majority. But it was an Islam that was introduced to him as a way of wakening him up. And so he's listening, he's paying attention, he's, he's pushing the program. And a part of that program that he was pushing was about correcting some of the stuff that he saw holding him back, that others saw holding them back, themselves back. So it was a corrective measures like a, an intermediate that allowed people to get stronger so that they can continue to move forward and upward, and he did. And alhamdulillah, he made hajj, and he started to come in contact with Orthodox Islam, and he winded up doing more and more of what the Quran was asking for, and he connected it. And he went back to all that stuff that was happening in his life. All the stuff that he had experienced from being in the home of a family that was being tortured by the Ku Klux Klan, their house was lit a fire. They had to flee their home, their area, and go to another state. They left Oklahoma and they went to Michigan so that they would feel safe. They had to let go of a lot of the, 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 the friends, the family, et cetera. They were, they were refugees that had to flee an area, not to the extent that our refugees are fleeing their safety for their safety in Palestine and the Sudan, not to that extent, but he lived that experience. And when he started speaking and teaching, his thing was about, this is not a good way to live. This is not the answer. This is not what we need to be doing. And if we are doing this, then we're not doing justice to ourselves. And even if I'm not the one who's experiencing it face to face, I have a duty to make sure that this doesn't happen, that it's stopped. And so he, he did not make it to be a lawyer. But that didn't stop him from thinking in that same vein. When, right before he was killed, he had already made moves to get to the United Nations. He had already made moves to try to get to the United Nations and force them legally to put things in place that would allow these changes to take place. It's one thing to talk about it. It's something else to roll up your sleeves and do something to help it stop. So he went to some place that he saw could be the source of a solution. Or he was on his way there before he was killed. 
So what am I saying to us? He didn't stop. That momentum that was started with his family even before he was born, that he was born into, that momentum he continued to do all the way through his life. So I'm saying that to all of us that are in this room. These things we can't close our eyes to. If not, I'm not worried about walking across the street or stepping out of my door and dealing with a bomb going off or dealing with my children or grandchildren being put into some kind of a concentration camp not type of space. I can't say I'm fortunate because as long as there's one child going through that, one adult going through that, just like what he did. He didn't, have to, he didn't have to get on that mic and do what he did. When he came out of prison, he started to see his life changing. He could have continued to think, okay, I'm focusing on Malcolm, I'm focusing on the Shabazz family, I'm focusing here. No. His fight wasn't just for himself, it was for humanity. Mm. And so all of us need to look at that. Now, while he was doing that, one more point. I interviewed um, a young lady who did know him personally. In my interview with her, she told me how she first met him. It was in New York. It was the location that we call Mosque Number 7. Mm -hmm. And she went out on, on an evening. The sessions were uh, uh, Wednesday nights and Friday nights. They would have these special sessions. And she went out to this session. And when she got there, each time she got there, she tried several times. She was always too late. She had to get on the train cross across a huge section of New York in the evening after she got off from work from cleaning somebody else's home to get there. When she got there, several nights in a row, they told her, sister, you're too late. You have to try and do it again. So this one particular time, she spoke up and she said, but I just got off from work and I've tried this before and she just went through the story. He heard her. He came to the door. He, he said, let her in. And she explained to me what she saw. He was tall. He was, he was um, appeared to have a sense of control. More than anything else, he was gentle. And he welcomed her in. He allowed her to do what she was trying to do. And from that point forward until she transitioned, she was a Muslim mm. because of the work that he had done and that one act of kindness. And she said she saw him like that for the rest of her until he transitioned. That's the image that she had of him. And so even after he transitioned, that's the image she wanted to portray. And so I'm saying that to all of us. You can be a big, you can, you can walk tall and you can carry a big stick, but do not forget about the people who don't have what you have, who are not able to be physically tall because of all the stress that's on them from their situation. So as we carry forward his legacy, let's keep that in mind. As we honor him on this day, let's keep that in mind, that we have to see all of humanity as part of our family and not just our immediate family. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. You know, it's it's really striking, you know, we, we see a world where so many communities, so many nations are just focused, so many individuals are just focused on their own pain. You know, and, and for example, we, we see people say, oh yeah, but this happened to us, and this happened to us, and they're constantly fixated on what happened to them, and they don't have the heart to feel, not just to see, to, but to, to feel the pain of other, other communities. And one of the remarkable things is that, you know, Malcolm's heart was so big that he was able to see that and, and feel the, the suffering of other communities. And to see his own pain became instructive. You know, the, the Buddhists have a meditation that when, when you're going through, when you're experiencing pain, to meditate upon the whole world which is experiencing pain, to expand that so that you become not just a witness to that pain, but you feel that pain. You, you, you have that deep sense of empathy with the, the sea of creation and the, and the family of, of humanity. And, and Malcolm really, really did that. And I, I also just wanna, wanna say that, you know, if it weren't for the, um, the 
transformative teachings and luminosity of the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we, we wouldn't have Malcolm the way we have him today. We wouldn't have had Muhammad Ali the way we have him today. And, and, I, I, and I, as, someone, as someone who grew up in a different America than many of my African-American brothers and sisters, and I have no idea that I grew up in a different country just because of the way I was treated, because of the color of my skin, and because of my gender. And my brother Randall and I, we grew up in different countries in a way. And you and I grew up in different countries in so many, on so many levels and in so many ways. But I've come to learn, and, and of course in graduate school, nobody was talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and about the movement Nation of Islam. We were studying all the medieval greats that, uh, that we all know, the household names. And, uh, and, it, and I've come, by coming to Chicago, I've come to witness the transformative power of what he did and the way he restored dignity and purpose and, and, and beauty to a people from whom it had been taken violently. You know, and, and I, I just I have to say that I'm still in awe of the transformative power of, of what the, that movement um, what that movement generated and still generates even today. And so, um, so I, I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when your dad and brother Malcolm were just starting out and, and, and to see that incredible restoration of dignity and purpose and meaning and beauty that had been just beaten and, and taken out of them. And that's part of the, part of the evil of this colonial project. I wanted to make one Yeah, reason. please go ahead. Um, I'm in in uh, continuation of what yeah. you're saying, the, um, the process of Islam being recognized in the United States of America started with Elijah Muhammad. The process of Islam being practiced in the United States out in the open continued with his son, Imam Wardadi Muhammad. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that that line is clear because what helped El Haji Malik Shabazz actually recognized that what he had learned at first when he was in prison and right afterwards wasn't the complete picture is when he sat with the son of Elijah Muhammad, who was Warthi Dean Muhammad, the, the, um, his son. So I'm, I, I wanted to make sure that, that, is, that it's clear that he learned the beginnings under the Nation of Islam, but he truly learned Al-Islam in its completeness when he started to sit with Elijah, I mean, with Elijah Muhammad's with, son, you know, Muzwar the Dean Muhammad uh, the first. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Okay. okay. Alhamdulillah. So both the Sudan and Palestine were very dear to Brother Malcolm. And so, so why don't we continue this conversation? Let, let's, let's, let's go to the Sudan where, of course, people are suffering on an industrial scale that is hard for us to even imagine right now. And then we'll, we'll bring it full circle with Palestine, inshallah. So Dr. Kim. Hello, assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thanks for having me. And then it's a pleasure to see everyone. Hopefully everyone's doing well. So I'm a historian, so I always like to begin things with dates. So 1959, Malcolm X, he's an ambassador to Elijah Muhammad. He made his first trip to Africa. And then he traveled to Nigeria, Ghana, Egypt, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Sudan. And then when he traveled to the Sudan, went to the city on the west bank of the Nile, which is Omdurman, was impressed by the city, and he was very impressed by the Sudanese people. So he wrote in his diaries how, much he, how impressed he was with the sincerity and generosity of the Sudanese people. And even to this day, if you travel through any, anywhere throughout the Arab world, all Arabs will say the Sudanese, they're the most generous Arabs, right? Mm -hmm. There's a concept called a Karim Sudani, right? So Malcolm was a recipient of this. So he traveled around, and then when he returned to the United States, met some Sudanese brothers in New York, and then some in Chicago as well, and then they continued with his education as far as Islam is concerned. All right, so then, that was in 1959, 1956, Sudan obtained its independence from, it's been under the control of Egypt, and then, Britain since, 19, since 1898. So it's called the Anglo-Egyptian condominium from 1898 to 1956. It was, on, it was, a, it was a 
under the colonial power. It was, a, it was colonized by Britain and Egypt. So just three years later, Ray Malcolm made his trip to Sudan. He's very impressed, thought that Sudan had a great future ahead of it. But then, since 1956, it's just been plagued by almost an endless series of wars, right? Poor leadership, and then it's a legacy of colonialism as well that continues to take place in the Sudan. So this is the most, this most recent war, this most recent war. So people can characterize it as civil war. It's not really a civil war. It hasn't entered into the civil war stage yet. Essentially, it's a war between two generals. So what's going on now? So April 15th last year, 2023, actually I was supposed to, I was supposed to go to the Sudan and I couldn't. And so then on April 15th, um, the militia that essentially was under the control of the previous regime, because the previous regime, which is Omar Bashir's regime, essentially what he wanted to do was make sure that his regime was gonna be coup-proof. So then he enlisted many of these peoples from the western part of Sudan, Darfur, these Arab militias, but then, essentially, they turned, about, turned out to be kind of like a Frankenstein monster. And then they ended up, they were responsible for staging a coup against him, right, in 2019. So then the army, the Sudanese army, and then this militia was supposed to engage in negotiations to try to incorporate this militia group, which is called the RSF, the Rapid Security Forces, within the army. But then the army said, well, you have, to, you have to become incorporated within the army itself in a year. Then the rapid security force said, no, we're not gonna do this in a year, we'll, t we'll take five years. So this is when the tension began, and then that war erupted. All right, so what's going on now? All right, so people talk about, for example, if you look at the internet and then did a Wikipedia search of Darfur, because then, I don't know if anyone remembers, for example, in 2003, 2004, Darfur was in the news quite often because you have many, many of these celebrities that were involved as far as engaging activism, stating that Darfur was a site of genocide, George Clooney, other people, right? So if you look at Wikipedia sites, it says that war in Darfur ended in 2011, but then that's a misnomer. That war never ended. So if you, if you live in Darfur, because I speak to people every day in the Sudan, and they said, yes, we're Darfurians, that war never ended. That war never ended. This is like a second phase or third phase of this war, actually. And so then, <clears throat> Sudan, it's a major humanitarian crisis. 6.6 .6 million are displaced within the country. 1.8 million are displaced within neighboring countries, such as Egypt, and then Uganda, Chad, and then Libya as well. So <clears throat> many of those people are suffering, many privations, and then what is going on? So there's a, there are belligerents. So of course, the main belligerents are the, the Sudanese army on one side, and then the RSF on another side. Mm -hmm. But then the individual groups, there are other countries that are involved are, that are funding the RSF such as the UAE, and then Libya as well. So they're getting, that's where they're obtaining their arms from. So then people were asking, what are the solutions? You can write to your Congress people and say, well, put pressure on the UAE to stop funding. Put the United States government to put pressure on the UAE to stop funding the RSF. So that's what Americans can do. And then the State Department always issues, because I get like, these updates from the State Department so we're gonna declare the RSF as a, a terrorist organization. And so what's going on? Uh, many people think, well, this war, there's no end in sight. So just think, the Sudan is a country, it was, a one, it was the largest country in Africa, has many resources, many resources. And, the, and then the chief resource, the greatest resource, so you said that my favorite country was England. My favorite country, it's not about the, the place, right? It's about the people. My favorite country is the Sudan. It's because of the Sudanese people. And so then these people are suffering because of the poor leadership in the country, and it's a legacy of, of, of colonialism as well. So, um, but then you can't just blame the colonialism. The, the leadership is poor. The, the leadership has no interest whatsoever in their people. And so then people always want to kind of create this kind of binary. The good guys and then the bad guys, right? So the good guys are the, the Sudanese armed forces, 
and then the bad guys or the RSF because of their militias. Yes, the RSF haven't committed many atrocities, but then the Sudanese armed forces haven't committed atrocities as well because they're bombing civilians, or because they're, they're indiscriminately bombing civilians in Darfur, and then in Medini. So let's give you some background information. The RSF is in control of all of Darfur. It's like the largest region. It's a, it's a region that's the size of France. And then they're in control of parts of the southern part of the Kordofan. It's in the west part as well. And then they're in control of uh, Medini, what Medini, which is in the central part of Sudan. So as I told um, Dr. Timothy, the, if you go to the, southern, the northern part of Sudan, it's relatively peaceful in the eastern part of Sudan. But then the rest is ravaged by war. Omdurman, that city that Malcolm X really adored and loved, has been completely destroyed. Mm. People had to leave their homes, and then they want to return to their homes. So then, the, the key is to try to have these two parties come to negotiations, but then in the history of Sudan, as far as these wars are concerned, no one wants to go, no one wants to think. The, the government always wants to think, we're gonna win this war. We'll, we'll outlast these individuals. We'll outlast the RSF, this is war of attrition, but then as far as, there's no winners actually. The losers are the Sudanese people. And just two things. Um, can you explain a little bit about how the legacy of colonialism has led to poor leadership and to fragmentation within these societies? As a historian, you can probably explain that to us in, a, you know, in a, just a couple of sentences. Okay, so the, the Sudan is not unique. Actually, as far as, because um, people always say, well, why, why aren't people paying attention to the Sudan, what's going on now in the contemporary period, 2024? So then I said, well, you know, people think, well, these people are always at war. Africans are constantly engaged in Indonesian warfare. The consequence, people are just, really, it's been relegated to the margins of people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. However, there's a, a brilliant book called Dictators and Dictatorships, and it says that when you have these military dictatorships, um, it's just very easy for them, because then they, what they, how they obtain power is when the British were there and the Egyptians were there, they placed in positions of power and authority specific ethnic groups, mm. like three different ethnic groups, the Jialin, Shawega, and the Nagla, and then they control the entire Sudan, and as a consequence, right? So then they place in positions of power their relatives, their members of their, their ethnic group as well, and so the members of the army, the, ar the armed forces, the officers, are members of those three ethnic groups. As a consequence, they're not really interested as far as development of the country. Mm -hmm. They're just only interested in essentially advancing their own interests as far as their mm -hmm. own ethnic group's interests. Mm -hmm. That's it. So then it's a legacy of colonialism that these people fail to break away from, fail mm -hmm. to break free from. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then tonight, uh, I'm those of you who, who, uh, who read the advertisements and other things know that you know, we're hoping tonight that we'll generate, we'll raise some consciousness, but we'll also generate some funds for relief in the Sudan and in Palestine. And so who's on the ground, apart from writing our, our Congress people and, and, um, and asking them to, uh, to try to place some restraints on the United Arab Emirates, um, who, who uh, I, I think have, uh, have been... Um, uh, responsible for, for warmongering in uh, lots of places other than the United Arab Emirates. Um, but uh, but apart, from, apart from that, so who's on the ground really making a difference in the Sudan that, that is worthy of our support? There's some humanitarian um, organizations, there's Human Rights, um, Amnesty International, because I work with them as well. As Amnesty, a right, okay. right. And then, so Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, those are the two that come to mind. Because okay. those are the groups that I work with. Okay, great. That's helpful for us. Okay, so, uh, so it's time for us to move to another one of Malcolm's loves, which is uh, the people of Palestine. So, uh, and so Brother Tarek, would you walk sure. us, lead us? Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you so much again. Um, you're, I mean, I should have gone first because you're not supposed to, you're supposed to save the best for last and these two were just absolutely phenomenal. Malish, malish. I hope, <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive you for that. Uh, but, you know, uh, I've, I've read it many, many times, but I thought, you know, before I came tonight, I'd read it again. Malcolm X's uh, 
article, Zionist Logic. And this is an article that he wrote after he visited Gaza in 1964. And interestingly enough, I always capture something new, even though it wasn't even a long article. It took, takes you about 10 minutes to read. It's not that long. But I just wanted to know where his mind was and what he saw and how he understood the issue. We're talking 1964. And he used the O word, which today, when you say occupation, and with the way the law has developed, that refers to the occupation of 1967. So this is three years before that actually took place. Mm. Inter international law had developed quite, you know, uh, uh, quite extensively up until that point, but definitely more so after 1967. And this notion regarding the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war is a concept that came about in the late 60s. So he used it obviously in the layperson understanding of the word occupation. As, as foreign, foreign domination against an indigenous population. So what he witnessed and what he saw and what he learned is that this is a native people that are living under foreign domination. And this is how we understood Zionist logic. And, you know, he kind of tore into this notion of Zionism, even without, I'm sure, having went through an extensive reading of all the Zionist literature, but just understood from what he observed itself. And he was just amazing at observing uh, and analyzing based on those observations. And that, you know, it made him uh, unique in that way. If there's one word that I would use to describe uh, Malcolm, uh, it would be disciplined. I think that represents, he was so disciplined in what he wanted to achieve. He wanted to learn, so he would read the dictionary from, fr from, front, to <laughs> from front to back, because he wanted to expand his vocabulary, expand his uh, grammar, expand the, to better his speech, and so he wanted to master. He didn't want to just be average. Mm. You know, he wanted to master material and going to Palestine and going to Gaza and witnessing what he what he witnessed it doesn't you know it doesn't take a sharp mind to figure out what's going on but he was a man of of genius so he was able to figure out what was happening just with the, just with that basic observation and one quick note on uh, Malcolm before I uh, talk about Gaza is that you can see the growth of Malcolm with the change of his name, Malcolm Little, to Malcolm X, to uh, Malik al Hajj al Shabazz, like you, you see the different developments in his in his in his life by just the change of his name, and he's just an iconic figure in history, and um, obviously I miss him dearly. So rest in rest in peace, rest in power, brother Malcolm. Okay, Gaza. You know, I want to start off this by talking about a phrase that has caught a lot of media attention. And this is a phrase that we say in our chants, that many people say in their rallies, and has been misinterpreted. But I think this is a great departure point because it goes into the essence of Zionist logic. And that is, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. This is the quote unquote anti-Semitic chant, right? This is how it's phrased, this is how it's characterized in our mainstream press. Because of a fundamental misunderstanding about what Palestine means and about what freedom means. Because freedom to the oppressor means I can no longer oppress. And that is a violation of their oppressive regime. And they can't have that, so therefore that's anti the regime, but you can't say that's anti-oppression because that would be a good thing. So you have to say that's anti-Semitic because if that sticks, then that shows that this group of people that are making this chant are bigoted, they're evil, they have something against the Jewish people, and so on. So I wanna start off by breaking down what this phrase actually means. When we say Palestine, we are referring to a geographic region that encompasses what is modern day Israel, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and Gaza. So this, 
describes a particular region. So you want to free this region, and then you give it a little bit more, you know, uh, conclusive um, demarcations by saying from the river to the sea, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Israel operates an apartheid regime, an apartheid system, to varying degrees of intensity throughout this region. So in the West Bank, it's more of an entrenched occupation. In East Jerusalem, it's through the use of administrative laws and mechanisms to make sure that you maintain a demographic ratio. And in Israel, it's used by laws and institutional discrimination and systematic oppression to make sure that you maintain racial domination over your Palestinian citizenry. And in Gaza, it's in the form of a brutal siege and blockade. That's, it. That's in its worst form in Gaza. So now I will talk about Gaza. If you don't understand October 6th and what that means, you will never understand October 7th. If I say October 7th, explain to me what happened. I'm sure a lot of you will be able to have, you know, will be able to shoot a few sentences <clears throat> to explain, you know, the events of October 7th. If I said explain October 6th, that was the normal time. That was the time of calm, the time of stability where Palestinians in Gaza were living in a cage, were living under restrictions, were not allowed to come in and go out without permission, don't have their own airport, don't have their own seaport, where their lives are controlled from every single aspect and every single angle. Israel, on October 6, had control of Gaza's electromagnetic sphere control of Gaza's territorial waters, control of Gaza's supply of goods, control of Gaza's tax system, complete control of who comes in, who comes out, what comes in, what comes out. Controlling the electricity. Mm. Palestinians in Gaza only had about three to four hours of electricity a day mm. before October 7. Palestinians in Gaza were drinking water, 97% of which was poisonous, unfit for human consumption before October 7. Palestinians in Gaza were living under a brutal siege and blockade that is declared illegal under international law before October 7. Mm. So they were living as Yov Galant, the defense minister of Israel said, human animals. And if you don't know how or if you even believe that Israel had this level of control, listen to the words of the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, when he said, after October 7th, there will be no fuel, no water, no electricity. Well, let's use some common sense. How are you able to control that if you don't have control over that? How are you able to shut that off if you're not the one in control of it? Now you don't even need an in-depth knowledge of the history. All you need to know is just that statement. Well, if you're able to do that, then by assumption, you had control over it. This was the life of Palestinians in Gaza. And let me, sh uh, let me throw one other fact here. Approximately 80% of the population in Gaza are refugees. Mm -hmm. Okay? And approximately half our children. They were born at the time of the siege. It's 18 years and younger. Okay? So what that means is that half of the population in Gaza were born into prison. Born into a cage. Born into a siege and blockade. Born into inhumane conditions. In 1948, when Israel was established, between that period and 1949, approximately 750,000 Palestinians were dispossessed from their homes, 200,000 of which fled into Gaza, trip, nearly tripling its population. And this caging entrenchment process 
this encampment, if you will, on the people of Gaza. This carceral space that was created incrementally and then intensely in the latter years started in 1948. Palestinians were deprived from returning to their homes. The refugees that were dispossessed, they could not come back. Those that tried to come back were considered infiltrators. Israel implemented a draconian policy, a shoot-to-kill policy. Kill anyone that tries to come back from their home, to, to, their, to their homes. Even if they only wanted to come back to grab their foodstuffs, to tow the soil, to grab some belongings, they were not even allowed to do that. And then throughout the 50s, Israel committed massacres on the people of Gaza. And then during the occupation, the first occupation was not in 1967. Israel actually occupied Gaza in 1956, from November 56 to March of 57, with a tripartite invasion with Great Britain and France in 1956, because the leader of Egypt wanted to nationalize the Suez Canal, and they viewed that as an economic threat. France and Great Britain and Israel together went in and um, started, started a war called the Suez Crisis and occupied, and Israel eventually occupied Gaza. Throughout that period, a thousand Palestinians were killed. And then in 67, Israel finally conquered and occupied the remainder of historic Palestine. And from 67 on, Israel slowly but surely implemented policies to entrench its occupation in Gaza. And then once the Palestinians expressed their opposition in a more forthright way in the, in the late 1980s, this is known as the first intifada, Israel responded by saying, okay, so you refuse to accept your subjugation, you refuse to accept your status as an oppressed people, we will now entrench it even more. And this carceral space that was created was now fortified again in 1996. In 1996, a full fence was created around Gaza. And then, a few years later, the second intifada broke out, the second uprising. So Israel said, okay, now we have to change the game once again because you still refuse to accept your subjugation. You're a people that really want freedom, and you will do whatever it takes to achieve it. Yeah. But now, because you've expressed that opposition again and again and again, we will now make it more intense on the population in Gaza. So in 2005, Israel said, we will change the style of the occupation from occupation by boots to occupation by remote. And then two years later, the siege was imposed in 2007. And for the last 16 years, Palestinians in Gaza have been living under that siege. And then we get to October 7th. Well, if you erase all of that, if you omit all of that, then you will have, OK, I'll give 10 seconds. If you omit all of that, you're taking Gaza out of context and you will never understand the history and the root cause. And if you just focus on the symptom of that cause and not its underlying root, you'll never understand the issue and you'll never be able to solve it. Thank you, brother. Wow. There's so much for us to learn and I hope and pray that this conversation for many of us will be the beginning of a, of a journey of education about what's really happening in the Sudan, what's really happening in Palestine, what's really happening in this country, and, and ways that we can be positive, agents of positive change, ways that we can help support the people that are making a difference, and, and to help re-educate our communities and help reach out to those suffering people in ways that, are, that, that mean something. You spoke the word freedom. And I think that freedom is something that, that is shared all across this panel. And it's something <clears throat> that we will now, as we tr take a quick break and we transition to an evening of, of um, musical celebration of the legacy and the life of Brother Malcolm, 
freedom is what jazz, I understand what jazz is all about. And again, I'm not a musician, I'm just learning from my brother Randall and from others who, who, who play. But my understanding is that freedom is really what jazz is all about. And of course, jazz was born within a community that did not know freedom and that was yearning for freedom and hungering for freedom. And so uh, it's really appropriate that tonight we will end musically and experiencing and thinking about the concept of freedom in a, in a radically different way, but not to forget Palestine and not to forget Sudan and not to forget the struggles of colonized peoples and denigrated peoples within this, own, within this country, but as a way to kind of envision a world where people can be free. Envision a world, the world that Malcolm envisioned. And that's a world that we're not living in yet, but it's a world that we continue to hope for, to pray for, and God willing to work for every day of our lives. So let's take a break. Thank you very much to my panelists. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, reconnect, we'll regather here in five minutes. Okay, and for those people who would like to pray Maghrib, the sunset prayer, we have a, a mosque area downstairs that's, uh, that's ready for you to, uh, to do that. So anyone who would like to pray Maghrib can do so downstairs. And we'll come back in, let's say, 10 minutes, and the band will be set up, inshallah. All right, assalamu alaikum. Okay, here we go. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. I want to thank you all for coming to this wonderful event. It is my privilege and distinct honor to introduce this illustrious band that we've curated for your listening pleasure. Um, we've heard some very distinct voices from our community this evening who they've expressed some very strong, um, I would say, ideas, opinions, and analysis on the ugly situation that this world has right now that we're faced with. And what comes to mind as I get ready to introduce and make way for the band is, you know, how we say in, in, in our prayer, say he, Allah is one. You know, and that resonates with me on so many different levels because say he, Allah is one. So in mathematics, we don't like division. We like to resolve back to one. Interesting enough, that's the same thing with music. Notes have tension sometimes, depending on where it's placed in a harmonic scale. And when you hear that tension, it forces your ear and it makes you want to resolve back to one. Now, I, I do have to say, um, as an FOI, member of the Nation of Islam for now over 30 years, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it really baffles me sometimes how the world is so easy to, in these days and times, accept Brother Malcolm, but when he was alive, the world hated Brother Malcolm. Same thing goes for Dr. King. Do you know many churches, when they changed that street to King Drive, they switched their addresses because they didn't want to be associated with Dr. King. So what it shows me, you know, Dr. Lynn talked about how the Quran has themes that you find from beginning to end that resonate through the whole book, the Holy Quran. And I find that life is cyclical in that same way that you'll find themes that resonate. So when God give, allows these visionaries with light to come into the world, to add light, to illumine our way, the contemporaries of that time most times don't understand what's in front of them. They condemn it, and then later it comes to light that, oh, wow, this person bought truth. So I just want to say this about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I'm making way for the band. Just consider this. Black people in America have been oppressed and enslaved for over 400 years. Now, do you, who, how many of you remember the story of Helen Keller? Helen Keller was a person who could not hear, could not see, and I believe she was mute. Now, imagine being born in a world where you can't hear, you can't see, and you can't vocalize. That is essentially what happened to black people through the process of 400 years of chattel slavery. So I'm making that point to say that the job that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had to do was a wake-up message to bring black people from what, now in, in biology, all of us went through several phases. We went through a germinal phase. The germinal phase is when the cells are all, they're dividing and they're multiplying. 
They really don't have purpose and focus yet. They're just dividing and multiplying. That's how we were found. Then we go into an embryotic phase where the brain starts to form. Then you become a fetus where the brain and the full spinal column is, is formed. And I'm saying all that to say is say he allows one. Let's not look at the process of an embryo and judge it. Let's understand that God's hand is still present. We are all still evolving, inshallah, rabbi al-alamin, into our eventual perfection. So with that being said, talking about the germinal phase of the cells, do you know that in music there are only 12 notes? 12 notes. Everything in creation has a vibration. So what you're about to witness now is these beautiful individuals that we're about to introduce are going to take the 12 notes and make them one and make them harmonious and make them pleasing to the ear. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Sister Margaret Murphy Webb, who will introduce our beautiful band, The Jazz Explosion. Thank you so much. We wanted to say a little bit about Malcolm X and jazz. Jazz is considered the voice of the African-American experience, and Malcolm X loved jazz. He stated that music is the only area on the American scene where the black man has been free to create. As a young man, he worked as a shoeshine boy in Boston's Roseland State Ballroom, where he met Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and Lionel Hampton. He grew to love jazz so much that he learned to play the drums and worked as a drummer under the stage name of Jack Carlton. After he joined the Nation of Islam, his love for jazz remained, though he stated it reminded him of his sinful past. In one of the letters he wrote from prison, he said, the comforting effects of jazz and his love, and talked about his love for the great Chicago vocalist, Dinah Washington. In another letter, he said, music is ours. It is us, and like us, like the infinite particles of life. It cannot be seen, can only be felt like life. Music without the musician is like life without Allah, both being in need of a home, a complete song and its creator.
This one, Roger Harris. <laughs>
Use your eyes. And uh, we'll call Mr. Roger Harris something that express himself. But like they were saying earlier, music, especially jazz music, it is an expression. And when we're up here, we are communicating and hopefully the spirit that we are trying for you guys to feel that you guys receive the message that we're trying to put forth. So we appreciate you and we thank you so much. So we're going to feature Mr. Roger Harris on the song he wants to play. We're going to get the beautiful, lovely Miss Songstress, Miss Margaret Murphy Well, to perform after the song. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Give her a round of applause. Um, I met her about book, book, book years ago, about 100 years ago. And I love this woman. This is my sister. We came up under the tutelage of Mr. Von Freeman. If you all don't know who Von Freeman is, please go and look him up. Because I don't use his word lightly. He was a genius. I don't use that word lightly, but the way he played, and his harmonic concept and how he played the instrument. He was a total genius, but we're gonna get up and uh... Put your hands together for our saxophonist and our leader today, Mr. Dwayne Armstrong. Our first song will be um, from the great African-American opera, Porgy and Bess. And this song was a lullaby, and in the movie it was sung by the great Diane Carroll. But we do it a little differently. Yeah. 
wish I'd jump in and the curtain is So we're going to do one of her most famous songs, and it is her country's birthday this year. There'll be celebrations all over the city. A day makes twenty four little hours with the sun and the flowers where they used to be rain. Oh. My yesterdays, they were so blue dear. But now, I'm a part of you, dear. Well, my lonely nights are so through, dear. Since you said you were mine. A 
Skies above won't be stormy since that moment of bliss. Your thrilling kiss was. a Miles Davis tune. You guys like Miles? I love this song because the lyrics say that there are no differences between us. That we are all just different shades of blue. See you next 
sky, you and I, we're all blues, we're all, we're all shades, we're all hues, we're just blue. Until we see you, God, again. Thank you. God bless you.